What happens in these situations with the with the Germans in Nazi Germany or the Turks in Armenia or the Japanese in Nanking or the um, you know the the Hutu in Rwanda? The question is. You know, people can point to political issues and economic issues and so on, but what it really requires for things like that to happen is major changes in the behavior of individuals. People, individuals, changing their decision making so they're capable of doing something that they would not be able to under other circumstances. So I've gotten very interested in how, how in a cultural context you can get a few people behaving a certain way and then you hit a tipping point and everybody starts behaving that way. So that's a, the, uh, anyway, so I started researching very deeply all of those historical incidents and what happens and what's going on in the brain that essentially allows you to short circuit the parts of your brain involved in um, emotional navigation of your decisions. So under normal circumstances, you wouldn't hurt somebody because oh, these areas light up that are involved in emotion and simulation of what it's like to be the other people and so on. But, but it turns out that if you can really structure in group and out group, um, then your brain start, stops caring about the outgroup. It does not see them that way. It doesn't activate these particular areas of the brain. And, uh, and you can treat them just like you would an object. If we can really understand from a brain point of view how that happens and how these things click off and so on, then, then we can figure out how to structure things on a societal level to try to prevent that from happening. One of the, uh, this is interesting actually, so I came up with an example in, in my talk in London and one of the people sitting there is friends with the Prime Minister of Lebanon and he took this and my book Incognito to the Prime Minister of Lebanon the next week and, and explained this to him to try to help the situation there. So I hope it has some impact. But, um, but what I pointed to was the Iroquois Indians, which are in, in this region actually, up, upper state New York and into Canada. Um, there were six different tribes, these six Indian tribes, they'd been fighting for, for generations. Um, and the great peacemaker came in around the 1600s. Um, he pulled all these tribes together under one umbrella. But the key is this, if you're a member, you're a member of your tribe, but also every tribe has uh, up to nine different clans in it. So the Eagle Clan, the Bear Clan, the uh, Beaver Clan, and so on. And, and it turns out those clans cross cut against the tribes. So I might be of the Eagle Clan, and the guy in that tribe over there is also the Eagle Clan. So we're kind of, we're, we're linked in that way. So in other words, you've got tribes running one way and clans running the other way, and it, it, it leads to a real stable thing, because you can't say, okay, they're the outgroup now, because now I've got a brother or clan member in that, right? So that's a very clever thing, and I don't see many examples of that besides the Iroquois Indians, and I'm looking for other examples, but I think if you can structure society so you have these cross-cutting in-group, out-group things, it makes it harder for people to just... Um, you know, suddenly alienate another group.